the biggest content creators are negative. Their, yeah. their, their, their focus point and purpose is to get people mad and angry at a thing uh, for clicks and, and subscriptions and all that kind of stuff. And Steph and I refuse to, to do that. We just say, you know what? You don't like something. We celebrate that. Move on. Focus on what you do like. You mm-hmm. don't like the new Star Wars. Fine. Focus on the Star Wars you do like. Hi, everybody. I'm Cami Chaos. And I am Rick Terosi. And we, as you know, are mildly interesting people. That's why every week we go out of our way to find wildly interesting people to talk to, to keep you entertained. Now, these folks may not be familiar to you, but rest assured, they are famous to us. Cami, who is our guest this week? Um, I'm excited. So the introduction to this person, very little to do with this person and had everything to do with me because he's one of my favorite humans. And I'm so excited. I haven't seen him in person in like five years. Mm-hmm, mm, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the last time I did, he was a horrible influence on me. I got in so much trying to get in trouble because we're really good at not getting caught, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> But he is a former co-worker of mine, a longtime friend, and an amazing, amazing human. And in addition to all of those qualities, he also has like a buttload of podcasts and is a huge Disney freak. And we're going to talk to him primarily about those things, about the podcasts and the Disney. Um, please, everyone, huge, warm heart welcome from my friend, Chris Lazon. Hi. Hi Hello. So excited to be here, y'all. So uh, when you, when you said you. that there is somebody mildly more interesting than y'all coming to the show, I'm like, is there somebody else coming or is it just, uh, <laughs> just you, <so. laughs> part of it, part of it is we draw out and you realize how, mo- how interesting you are. That's the, that's the fun of the show. Oh, this is like a therapy session. I love that. Exactly. It's, it's cheaper awesome. than therapy too. It, it so. is cheaper oh, than therapy. Gosh. That's our alternate tagline, mildly interesting people. It's cheaper than therapy. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so as as I was telling Rick before the show, I didn't know you had three podcasts. I knew yeah. that you I knew that you were I knew that you were podcast promiscuous. Oh, I love that term. Thank you. That's, that describes <laughs> me very well. It does. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I didn't know that there were like fully three. And so the what I'm going to ask while we dive in, because I just have reserved all of my curiosity for this conversation. I didn't mm-hmm. know additional research aside from loving you. Um, Tell us the three podcasts in in the order that you like the most. <gasps> yeah, oh tell me what your favorite Pick child favorite. is. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's mm-hmm. difficult. Um, okay, so Dark Side Divas is my favorite. That's uh, a podcast where me and my best friend talk about uh, Star Wars visual media in chronological order, which Star Wars does not do, Excellent. as you know. It doesn't tell the stories yes. in order. It doesn't. Uh, and then my... Uh, <laughs> uh okay I, I have to i have to i have to uh, i i love them all Ties but these. my my second my second oh. favorite is my newest podcast it's a podcast called for light and dice it is a, a tabletop role-playing star wars uh, uh podcast that i've done with people i have met through uh the content creator community um <laughs> and um it's 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 me at my nerdiest if you want to hear a bunch of really nerdy star wars fans pretend to be different yes. characters and tell really cool stories it's a really cool podcast and then my third podcast is um marvelous divas which is i do with the same person uh, that i do dark side divas with my best friend and it's kind of the same thing um as dark side divas except we talk about the marvel movies and tv shows nice all i have to say is how the fuck did i not know you were doing the marvelous divas because I, the one podcast i knew about was dark side divas Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. for obvious reasons, I'm going to know about that, right? Star Wars, Chris, Divas, amazing. <laughs> right. right. Um, wow. Okay. All right. Why do you have so many podcasts? I love it. Uh, so it, it goes back. To, so I started a podcast with my best friend. She had already been doing a few podcasts and she is a voice actress and she's just a natural storyteller. But when I get with her, we start talking. We, I'm told, are hilarious. And um, we are those two catty people at the party that sit in the corner and, like, starts talking crap about everybody. And 
but when you confront you like you try to talk to us our meek little introvert selves start activating and we're just like <laughs> oh my gosh what are you doing talking to me um but we just have like a real we have really good chemistry and we started off trying to do one about professional wrestling because back in the day uh mm-hmm. we were both professional wrestling fans she kind of lapsed on that and then i was trying to tell her uh women are amazing now in wrestling and they have like the best characters and you should totally watch again with us but you know, we started that off at the beginning of COVID and surprise, surprise, there were a lot of wrestling people that weren't very great with the COVID lockdown thing. Yeah. And it was really upsetting us. So we decided to focus on something else that was more positive. We were in the middle of a big Star Wars rewatch. In fact, between uh, recording sessions, we were like, did you see that Clone Wars episode? Did you see this, that? And we decided, hey, that's our podcast. We should just do Star Wars. And slowly but surely, as we got deeper into the Star Wars story, you know, I would check our podcast analytics or whatever. And it was like 100 people, then 1,000 people, then 2,000 people kept growing. Wow. And I started making connections and friendships with other co- other podcast content creators. And before you know it, uh, Steph and I have this like huge community of people that listen to both of our podcasts. And it's been amazing and awesome. And lo and behold... I'm actually kind of good at it. And I never thought in a million years <laughs> I would be good at talking. That's not my thing. Mm-hmm. It, mm, it is your thing. It's just not your thing when you're put on the spot. What I know about you is if you're having a conversation with someone that you love, you are out there and you are all over the place and you are just so willing to share your soul with people. And it's one of my favorite things about you. Oh, wow. I, ne- I never knew that about my... I mean, I always... I always thought I was a terrible communicator. I had a really hard time sharing my feelings, being honest, and through lots of therapy, which was kind of my focus for COVID lockdown. It's like, what else am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to mm-hmm. have, have a weekly therapy session and join a therapy group. But my other piece, the other piece of my therapy is my time with Steph, where we're recording our podcasts. And before yeah. we record, we talk, we tell each other about what's going on with our families or jobs and whatnot. And lo and behold, I'm realizing that I'm now a much more open person. Uh, and much more open with my feelings, which I never, like four years ago, never, never would have thought I would have gotten there. I'm proud of you. Oh, thank you. That's really beautiful. So <laughs> Dark State Divas is the crown jewel of the podcasting empire for Chris. Yes, I think so. It's yeah. the, it's, it's the, it's the one where I became more, the most comfortable with the concept of recording podcasts and yeah sharing yourself and being silly and being funny and sometimes being risque. Well, not sometimes all the, all the time, (laughs) but, um, uh, but being free to be who I am without any shame and then having people compliment me for it. Yeah. Yep. Good. Before I let Rick ask questions, because this is what happens. We get someone on the show that I know really well and that I love. I'm just and the I, producer here. I don't need and to I, ask any questions. I don't let him talk at all. But before we do that, I want to talk I have about a, the... I have a beverage. I'm fine. You two just go okay. ahead. I'll be right here if you need me. I want to talk about the chronology of Star Wars because that's rough, right? The, the, the chronology of Star Wars and studying it actually prepares people emotionally for the study of the chronology of the Marvel Universe. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I find that you're doing both of them absolutely fantastic. What is it about the chronology puzzle of Star Wars that, well, that, that has you in its clutches? Well, so I, I've loved Star Wars since I was a kid. Uh, my <laughs> mom used to always tell me the story that... Um, I, I guess Return of the Jedi had made it back into theaters in 1983 and I was barely one. And so she took me to it as a little baby and I was a very loud, fussy baby, except when she took me to go see this movie, I was completely <laughs> quiet. And and so when I was old enough, I'd have the Return of the Jedi lunch pail and all this. So I've always been a Star Wars fan, but when you get into the uh, the nuts and bolts of how people designed the overall story, Part of it, you have to bear in mind, the guy that that invented the Star War didn't care about chronology yeah. and didn't mm-hmm. care about uh, being consistent and just kind of did whatever. He wanted to make a really cool movie <laughs> with special effects and had a story. And there was a story there. Uh, but then there are other people that come in that try to add more to the story that in a really weird way, they're fixing the story. Mm-hmm. They're making it, they're trying to make it more, uh, have more sense to it. And so... It's really just a, a pouring yourself into it. You learn more about like the backstage 
deepness of like the politics of Star Wars and how people pitched ideas when George Lucas was involved. And, you know, George Lucas had a certain way of, of doing things. And uh, he, you know, wasn't always kind to things like women and, and stuff we like are, that. We are things. In case you didn't know, women were things. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's <laughs> no, uh, for, for women, there's no underwear in space, for example. And um, mm-hmm. what's wrong with having a slave outfit? Uh, as a bikini like that's makes sense to me right uh so you you go from that to suddenly disney coming in and buying it and now you have all these different people who love star wars but they also want to make it more inclusive and it's changing and they're not just uh adding to what was already done they're going back and adding more to the past at the same time and so it's really filling out um the whole lore and mystic mysticism of star wars to the point where it is its own legend. It is its own subgenre. It's not sci-fi fantasy. It's not uh, uh, adventure. It's just Star Wars. Yeah. And I love that. All right. I have to make a tiny note and just say, if you ever want to come visit, I know we don't have like Disneyland in our backyard or anything, but if you ever want to come visit, we do have Star Wars sheets on the guest bed. So I actually want to go to Portland really bad. Uh, I have family members <laughs> that moved to Portland during lockdown. And mm-hmm. the only way I'm going to get to see them is if I go there because they do not want to come back to California. Uh, so I can't blame them. Portland is an amazing city. Portland was on my list of places I would have not mind lived except for the snow. I'm, I'm a wuss when it comes to cold weather. We didn't used to get snow at all. And now, yeah. Yeah. It's it's as if the world, the world weather patterns are changing for some reason. I can't figure out why. Yeah. I wonder. Oh, well. Has anyone figured out a way to explain? (laughs) No, I think it's just coincidence. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Um, Rick, do you have questions or because I've well, got this like side journey that we could go on? Well, hopefully this won't divert too much from that journey because I'd like to continue along this conversation. But I'm just I'm just curious, like as you're describing Star Wars, you know, I I'm old enough that, you know, I saw Star Wars in the theater like 10 times and um and, you know, Return of the Jedi, our thing in common is that was the first one my mom let me skip school to wait in line oh, wow. for tickets for the premiere of that one. So um, I guess my question comes like, that's such an expansive universe to understand and explore. Like, what motivates you to also, like, take on another gigantic universe that i'm a huge fan of which is the marvel universe like how 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 does how do you find the curiosity to delve into both of those structures and and the characters within them there's something about these movies the, it's just i love them a lot and it's easy for me to it doesn't feel like work when i'm doing research on this stuff and i'm talking about it with my best friend because the reality is if there was a mic there or not we would still do that we would still get together every so often and just geek out uh, and so it's easy for me to do. The thing I love in particular about Marvel is that Marvel is the Star Wars for the younger kids in my family. Mm-hmm. Um, they love Marvel. Watching them grow up, you know, I remember, I remember when they were all of them were like two, three, four. You know, we got them the baby Marvel uh, toys and all that kind of stuff. And now they're wearing the T-shirts. They have the big full action figures. They have opinions on which Marvel movie is their favorite and why. And mm-hmm. Uh, sharing that experience with them is just like so cool. Um, it they're not into Star Wars except for Grogu. They really like the Baby Yoda, which is yep. great. But but their Marvel is their Star Wars, and getting getting that insight from them is super in- interesting. And it's easy. It's just easy for me to talk about at the end of the day. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I'll be honest, the characters are hot. It's true. <laughs> I mean, and, and they wear skin tight suits all the time. It's not even. It's not even that. It's a swagger. It's like, yeah, you know, give give me a, a Natasha Romanoff, a Black Widow. Give me an Agent Carter. Give me uh, Steve Rogers. Not because they're uh, that's appearance America's wise. ass, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not just because they're good looking, but because of people who they are. Like their yeah. their competency yeah. uh, is, level is, or what my podcast co host calls the competency boner, uh, is very strong with all of them, and I love that. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Nice. So Rick's question actually just strengthened my little side quest question. You said something that really hit hard when you were talking about uh, Disney acquiring Star Wars. And it is that it took this 
when I, so I'm a little, uh, when I was a little girl, I was born in 1977, the year of Star Wars. Obviously, I did not see that movie when I was a baby. And if I did it, I would have no recollection. But I grew up with Star Wars as well. And it was a huge part of my childhood. I had all of the action figures. I had the land speeder. Uh, I had a tauntaun. I Mm -hmm. like would fight my Barbies with my Star Wars action figures. And that was just like normal commonplace for me. Uh, But I had to bring those Barbies in. And I had to bring in the Polly Pockets and the My Little Ponies. Because my options as a girl who was like looking for girls in the media that I was consuming was like princess Leia with her boobs out. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was like, I want it. I, my first crush ever, and it should be of no surprise to anyone was Harrison Ford, (sighs) Han Solo. And then Indiana Jones. Are you kidding me? Right. Right. Like that was my, but also I wanted to be Han Solo. Like it was like, I was like, that's who I am. That's me. Let's go on an adventure. I'm going to wear those tight black pants, those tall black boots and that vest. Yes, I am. <laughs> that's um, awesome. But I never, like, I didn't, because I was so young, potentially, I didn't really think about how non-inclusive Star Wars was um, because it looked like they maybe tried. But then as you get older and you understand inclusion and diversity, you look at all of the really blatant things that were done that were racist and sexist. And it's it's super upsetting. Um, But I never would have thought of Disney as being inclusive until the last decade. Like Disney also was something that didn't feel inclusive to me in my childhood because it was all little white princesses for the most Mm -hmm. part. Uh, and parents dying so that children were orphaned um, and animals that didn't wear pants, but did wear tops or did wear top or did wear pants, but not tops like one or the other. No one wore both tops and bottoms. Um, and so there was just this whole. It didn't feel neither of these things felt inclusive. And when I was raising my my child, I actually didn't let her watch Disney movies for a long period of time because they were so traumatizing. Right. She's allowed to watch anything she wants to now. She's an adult. But when she was little, I didn't. That's crazy. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. I have no, I have no more control over the, what she watches. I also threatened to take away her internet the other day because she was doing, she was Googling medical things. And I was like, you Google one more medical thing. I'm going to take away your internet, (laughs) which you can't do. That just doesn't work. I can't. Yeah. Um, Thanks, technology. Thanks. <laughs> uh, when did you see, like, when did that, oh, my God, Disney's taking this in the right direction. Disney is not, it's not just that Disney made it family friendly, and they did. Um, when did you realize that Disney was trying to make it inclusive and welcoming to everyone? Um, one of my favorite Disney movies is uh, Emperor's New Groove. they brought in so much um it's a comedy right but then i I was hearing all these interviews in college about how disney went to south america and talked with people about the myths and legends of you know all the different um cultures that were there and they really inserted a lot of that stuff into the movie and then casting eartha kit and uh making sure that they represented the culture very well that's when i realized they're they're making an effort because I remember um, I had a really, really good friend in uh, elementary school. Um, Aladdin had just come out and he wasn't allowed to watch Aladdin because um, he, he had his family was Muslim. They were from um, they were from Iran and they thought Aladdin was a complete whitewashing of their culture. And it was really, really offensive to them. Yeah. And I never thought about it like that before. I love the music and I was like, but it's such a great movie. What's the big deal? You know, but it, like, to them, it's like a thumb in the eye. Yeah. And then, yeah. of course, you uh, another thing um, with the theme parks, they had they had an attraction that was based on their Son of the South oh cartoon, my gosh. cartoon right. which yes. is such a racist yes. thing. Yep. And it's like one of their key rides. They just took that away, and they're redoing it, which is, of course, causing a lot of controversy with the, I would say, less understanding Disney fans. Um, but that's when I kind of realized that there was starting to be a turning point. They started to make more stories that were representative of, um, of, uh, different groups of people. They were doing it more so on the Disney channel side of things. Like they had 
uh, shows where there were a lot of people of color. There were mm-hmm. still, you know, white men and women as, as the main characters, but they were starting to do more and more and more. Um, and then I think it was uh, right around the time that they settled things with Pixar is when they started coming out with like Princess and the Frog and, mm-hmm. and which I love. I love that movie a lot. Yeah. Uh, and that and that's when I kind of realized Disney's going to start really making an effort to do better. Um, now, uh, there are strikes happening right now. I need to call that out because right now I have yep. friends that are dealing with that. They still have worker rights issues, I would say. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, the current CEO, as problematic as he's been on that front, he's really making an effort on the inclusion, civil rights, diversity side. Because, I mean, the company is going to war right now with certain political groups that yeah. want to see me and women and other people of color uh, go away. Right? Yeah. And so it's it's a complicated thing. But I think I, I would say so I would say Disney started to really turn around 2001, 2002. Um, but I, I didn't really understand fully how um, awful representation was until I started the Dark Side Divas podcast. I knew I knew deep down that George Lucas had problems with women, but my, my co-host is a woman. She has very particular views, very strong views. I thought I was a feminist, but I wasn't until I heard her story. I heard her perspective, and she started to share with me her pain about not feeling represented as a woman. And I realized I have a lot to learn on that front. As progressive as I thought I was, I, I really wasn't. And I finally uh, feel like the outcome. And I'm still, I'm still on a journey with her. I'm not always perfect. I'm still, I'm still a dumb boy in a lot of ways. But she's really shown me how important it is to be inclusive and what her experience has been like as a woman. And I, I, f- I feel like that my, that was one of the coolest things about doing a podcast with her is being more aware of that. What is her name? Stephanie. Stephanie, thank you for all you're doing. Because if you were helping Chris, who is already so open-hearted and inclusive and wonderful, I can only imagine that you are changing other people's minds around the world too. So you rock. On that same thread, what what do you think the Marvel acquisition did to that whole thing? Because they they basically acquired creative assets that to some extent were more widely diverse than anything Disney had done in the past. Do you think that had an impact or do you think that was part of the motivation for them to acquire that property? Marvel has a very long history. So we only focused on the visual media aspect, but if you go to Mm -hmm. the comic book aspect, um, that company, the Marvel comic company did a lot of stuff to move things forward. Stan Lee was uh, very pivotal in a lot of different ways. Like the X-Men comic book series was a metaphor for civil rights movement and different groups of people. At the same time though, uh, Marvel made some missteps and did some bad stuff. Uh, uh, Because of the strikes, Steph and I are actually focusing on comic book series and we're reading a comic book series that came out in the nineties where women are being called bimbos and, and uh, they're not being represented very well. And, but at the same time, that's still a comic book company that like talked about mutants in the same way. Uh, some people talk about uh, queer people uh, mm-hmm. and like that whole fight. And so it's, it's interesting. I know acquiring Marvel studios did a lot to shape how Disney deals with creativity and creators in general. They let them do their thing for the most part. There are big exceptions when it comes to like marketing and merchandising, but for the most part, um, Marvel is way more diverse because Marvel's always been more diverse and they've always wanted to bring these different characters to the forefront because they knew already that it worked. Black Panther was going to work because the Black Panther comic decades ago worked very well. Um, Mm -hmm. Same for Captain Marvel uh, uh, and everybody else they've introduced. So um, that was already, I felt like that was already baked into the company. And I, I think that that Marvel has proven that you can be as diverse as you want. As long as the story is good, the character is good, it doesn't matter. But it's important to be diverse because that's, that's, that is the soul of Marvel at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Marvel has far more representation in their comic book, in their visual media and comic books. And comic books, um, yeah. Than anything else I experienced. And as a, as a young girl nerd, uh, mm-hmm. that was really important to me. 
and watching it now, it feels really good to be able to watch and see that it continues to grow. Yeah. I mean, a, a friend of mine, we were talking about how, you know, we were saying, aren't they going to do another X-Men uh, cartoon show based on the nineties X-Men cartoon? Cause that, That's that so show much. was my jam. But if you look at the <laughs> roster back in the mid nineties, it, there is a powerful black woman. Mm -hmm. There is a person in a wheelchair. There is, you know, there's so much diversity just out the gate in that, in that mm -hmm. roster. And like, gosh, it's so cool. And I, and I want more of that. Uh, and, and we're getting more of that. And I, uh, and anyway, I, I, I personally think that Marvel is a great template that that proves that you can have strong women, you can have strong people of color, and it, it, everything will be okay. Nobody's gonna nobody's going to get lose anything by having this person that represents a different part of the of the human community that's never been represented before. In fact, it makes us better when we get to experience that. Where do you feel, how do you feel Disney, I'm going to say Disney with Star Wars and with Marvel uh, is doing on queer culture? Uh, that's a complicated one. Um, it is. Marvel, Marvel's starting to do stuff like um, certainly with um, a couple of the recent films, they've had queer characters. Star Wars, though, um so in the comic books, they introduced a, a major queer character called Dr. Aphra. She's mm -hmm. super awesome, super amazing. She's very messy, just like any other Star Wars character. Um, and her being uh, attracted to a woman is a key character uh, storyline in one of the comic book series. So that's cool. They have a book. Star Wars has a book series called The High Republic, where there are a lot of queer coded characters all over the place, but nothing in visual media. And I'm still waiting for that. Um, they're not getting a passing grade for me right now. I have this. So I remember, let's go all the way back to Star Wars, where Leia and Luke kiss. And I'm like, oh, because oh. like, once you know, you know, and you're like, that's disgusting. Oh, my <laughs> God, that's happening. And and for most people, that was just like, oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, so having a brother and sister kissing was greeted with far less ire than a like one second to women kissing in a leader right. movie, not even main characters. People boycotted the movie. There were entire groups that were like, Star Wars is now evil. There's a lesbian. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. A what China, are we going to do? China had that scene removed completely yeah. from that movie. Yeah. And it's terrible. Um, I like the fact that um, in some ways, sometimes Disney will just say, you know what, we're just going to go ahead and push forward with this movie. We're not going to edit it. If we lose out on the China and Saudi Arabia market, so be it. Oh, well, whatever. The movie will yeah. still get popular. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes they're right. Yeah. I but just unfortunately not. I, not want them, I want them to push more. Uh, I do. I want them. I, I. Okay, Rick. Mm. I don't think you're a bad person. I just think that you're a straight white cis man who the world was created for. He knows this. He, Folks, well, yeah. this is not this is not something new that I'm right. telling him. He knows. He's 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 yeah. no no spoiler alert there, but potentially a spoiler <laughs> alert for people who don't know that Luke and Leia were brother and sister. You may have just ruined the entire thing for them. If that's the case, I'm sorry, but I'm glad I warned you because it's super icky. Yeah. Super icky. Like, icky. Also, Han Solo was right there and she was obviously just being stubborn because she had feelings for him. Because mm -hmm. who doesn't have? Raise your hand if you don't have feelings for Han Solo. Oh my gosh. I love don't, Han so no, much. No, don't. Raise your hand if you don't oh. have feelings. Oh. See? Even Rick won't raise his hand to that because it's all fucking nope. solo. All right. I love, right. I, look, I love Han Solo a lot, though he's problematic in many he's ways. Deeply problematic. <laughs> Problem, <laughs> um, my my favorite Harrison Ford is still Indiana. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I saw the latest uh, film a lot in the theater. Um, mm -hmm. Do we do we accept it? Because up until this, I've still been saying there are only three Indiana Jones movies. I so couldn't. I, I couldn't accept the other one. Uh, you know what? Kate Blanchett is awesome, so yes, I'm always going to accept any movie with her in it. Okay. But I like the latest one a lot. Okay. Um, cool. I love what it was trying to do. Um, I thought it. I thought I personally thought they nailed it, but I understand why people don't like it. That's a, a 
A, we haven't seen it yet. It, it, okay. I am very excited to see it, but we haven't seen it yet. We're still yeah, not going this, to theaters. Uh, you're not alone. My my no. co-host doesn't either. Um, she will. Uh, she has an autoimmune disorder that she talks openly about on the mm-hmm. podcast. Uh, she would risk her life going out to a movie theater yeah. because people did not do a good job with vaccinating, masking up, and that you know we lost that battle, unfortunately. Our main, our, our, our main motto on any of our shows that we do, we say, it is okay to not like something. You don't have to explain to anybody why you don't like something. In fact, it's, it's so subjective. We're all wired differently. You know, you could love something similar, but not like anything at all on a different thing. It's fine. Um, but my thing is that if you don't like something, move on. Yeah. Focus on something that you love. Make yeah. life mm-hmm. about uh, joy and happiness and celebration versus uh, wallowing in negativity. And that's the problem overall. You have come with, a long way in therapy. Right? Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, you, uh, you, uh, 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 when Steph and I started these podcasts, they're uh, the biggest content creators. And unfortunately, this is still the case. The biggest content creators in all the different fandoms, whether it's the Star Wars one, Marvel one, D and D's and all the other stuff I like. Um, the biggest content creators are negative. Their, yeah. their, their, their focus point and purpose is to get people mad and angry at a thing uh, for clicks and, and subscriptions and all that kind of stuff. And Steph and I refuse to, to do that. We just say, you know what? You don't like something. We celebrate that. Move on. Focus on what you do like. You mm-hmm. don't like the new Star Wars. Fine. Focus on the Star Wars you do like. And yeah. maybe in the future at some point, there will be a new Star Wars that you do like. And leave yourself open for that if you care. You don't have to care either. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of been, uh, uh, I always uh, tell people that Steph and I, we make the largest um, positive uh, podcast for these fandoms. Unfortunately, the negative ones are bigger. Well, the negative ones, yeah. sadly, will always be bigger. I very much, uh, I have, I know this will be shocking, but I have a, I have a very similar feeling on the uh, put out positivity in the world focus more on what you do love. And if it's something that negative that you're focusing on, focus on a way that you can change it, not on a way that you can tear someone down about it. Um, I am, I don't like, I usually get really excited when we do the mildly interesting questions because it means it's time for mildly interesting questions. And it's one of my favorite parts of the show. That being said, it's also leading us toward the end of the show. And I feel like Grover at the monster at the end of the book where I'm like, don't turn the page. No, <laughs> let's just keep Chris here forever. Um, so, Hey, Chris, do you want to be our senior correspondent for nerdery? Oh yeah. That'd be awesome. Nice. I'm so excited. Okay. So folks who watch the show, we're doing things a little bit different today. We, could have an entire episode about Star Wars. We could have had an entire episode about Marvel. We could have had an entire episode about the other podcast about the Star Wars role playing that we didn't even talk about. And now we don't have time for. We mm-hmm. also could have had an entire episode about diversity and inclusion. Mm-hmm. Also, we could have an entire episode about Disney. Not only does Chris love Disney, but. He's a Disney park super super van. And when we booked him to record on a weekend, I was like, I was really surprised Chris was able to record with us on a weekend. He's Carve apparently a Disneyland. Yeah. And then yesterday I saw on your social media that you were at Disney and I was like, <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. Whew. I was like, I'm going to change my reservation from Sunday to Saturday. Mm, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> nice. um, so we have a special version of our mildly interesting questions just for Chris today. And it's Oof. the Disney mildly interesting questions. But, uh, we didn't want him to miss out on the standard validation questions, so we're doing both. So awesome. it's gonna be a mega round, a mega round, it's like it's ten instead of yeah. five. So yeah. here's what we're gonna do: I'm gonna ask you these five questions. Please try to answer them as efficiently as you can. If okay. for some reason you are unable to answer them efficiently, or you need to skip a question, go ahead and let us know. But we will come back to it. You do still have to answer it, and Rick will edit it down in post to make it look speedy and wonderful. <laughs> okay. So all of these parks are going to be about Disneyland proper, although I will not be hurt if you veer into California Adventure or California, I can't remember what the mall with all the restaurants is. Oh, Downtown Disney. Downtown Disney. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So primarily we're talking about Disneyland, but I am also including Downtown Disney and California Adventure in that because they are a unit. 
Question one, assuming you get there at opening, what is the first thing you need to do? It always depends who I'm with. Uh, if I'm with a ride person, uh, we'll probably do one of the big thrill rides like a Space Mountain. Uh, if I'm with a merchandise person, we'll go hit up the merchandise shops right away. Uh, if I'm with a photographer person, which I, those are kind of sometimes my favorite people to go with because they just like to hang out. Uh, we'll go probably to an area of Disneyland where that looks beautiful in the morning. Thanks. And we'll just hang out. Fantastic. Uh, question number two, what is the most overrated attractive that you should never waste time on? Most overrated Peter attraction. Peter. Oh, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's 10 seconds long. You wait an hour in line. Uh, and it's based on a very racist cartoon. Mm -hmm. It's still, and there's still some racist iconography in there. Okay. Uh, question number three, what is the one place I should eat? Uh, it's not a place. Uh, you have to get a churro. I love and you. you. Can get a churro <laughs> all over, uh, both parks. So you have to get a churro. Um, and he, he means that the last time I was at Disneyland, I was with Chris and we had to get a churro twice. Yes. So, yeah. And now they have specialty churros that are Do they unique have to each cart. churros yet? Uh, I know Walt Disney World is testing them. I <gasps> don't, I don't know if we're getting them yet, but there are, they are coming. Uh, however, sometimes there are missteps with churros, with the special custom ones. For example, mm -hmm. there was a banana peanut butter churro, but there was no actual real fruit on it. It was like a banana paste that a yellow banana paste that looked just like mustard. So hmm. was it on the outside or was it like a mustardy banana filling or? It was on the outside. They like dripped it on top. So it looked like you, you're pouring mustard on top of a churro. Hmm. That's upsetting. That was not a hit. Okay. <laughs> uh, question number four. What's the one thing worth waiting in line for no matter how long the line is? If I'm with it, one of my kids and they really want to wait in line to see a character, that's uh, it. Oh, that is uh, not the answer I expected. And that's such a good one. Um, I've gone to Disney so much now that there really isn't a ride anymore that I have to wait for. I, cause I get to do them all the time for me now. It's like when I, well, let me go back. When I used to go to Disneyland only once a year, I was obsessed sad. with doing, doing sad everything. Times. Yeah. And it was sad times. Now I can go all the time. I don't have to do anything. I can, I have shown up to the park, not going on one ride nice. and I love it. Mm -hmm. If so, let me rephrase that. I'm coming down. I'm visiting you. You're taking me to Disneyland. What's the one thing that you're going to take me to wait in line for no matter uh, what? We're going to we're going to go to Oga's Cantina. Yes. And then we're going to go on Rise of the Resistance. Yeah. And and then we're going to uh, try to make some money with Hondo and Naka and ride the Falcon. I we're basically going to we're basically going to stay in Star Wars land the whole time. Yeah. And this time I'm wearing a costume. <laughs> a uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Question number 5. What's one Disney hack you think every first time Disneyland visitor needs to know? When you go in the morning, it's empty and it stays that way for a good two and a half hours. So if you really want to do some of the big uh, theme park attractions and not purchase any of the extra fast pass lightning lane stuff, whatever they call it, go, just show up at rope drop. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Which goes all the way back to our first question. Assuming you get there at opening. I love it. Mm -hmm. Full circle. All right, we've got to change gears. Change gears. Getting away from Disney, maybe. I mean, you might have a Disney answer to one of these questions. But we're going to go now move on to the standard mildly interesting questions. Same rules apply. I'm going to ask them. You're going to answer them. It's going to be fantastic. Let's go. Question number one. What is one habit that you would like to pick up over the next year? Ooh. Um. I would like to be better about leaving notes for myself when I'm doing a very complicated project and use other technology to do that with. So for example, I just discovered this voice to chat uh, uh, plugin for uh, Notion. I don't know if y'all use Notion, but mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. really cool note taking tool. Um, I am dyslexic. So typing and reading is hard. It always takes extra effort, but I started using this feature and I talk into a microphone on my computer and it writes everything out for me. Then I have a little Grammarly thing I use to like make it polish it up and make it grammatically correct. Um, I, I need, I want to use that more uh, when I'm just in my meetings with people and I'm taking notes. I can't talk and take notes at the same time, but if I use this thing, I can. Nice. Excellent. Uh, would you rather know question number two, excuse me. Would you rather know a little bit about a lot of things or a lot about just one thing? 
Uh, I wish I knew a lot about one thing because I always have so much respect for experts, like people that are just like completely like, like my partner, Eric, he knows a lot about infrastructure. He knows a lot about numbers and finance and stuff. And I wish I knew a topic that deeply. I don't. I'm the, I'm the other way. I have to say his, Eric's knowledge of finance and numbers when, uh, like, uh, yeah, Eric had to do some training with me on some stuff and I was floored by the man's brain. Mm-hmm. Floored. Hi, Eric. Um, <laughs> question number three, second most important question that I'm going to ask you today. What do you need from the grocery store? Uh, now I need sparkling water. Mm. What's your go-to sparkling water of choice? Uh, you know what? I'm not picky right oh. now. Um, hmm. I went to went to France recently. Uh, mm-hmm. I was never big on the sparkling water thing for for some reason. And then I went to France, met coworkers for the first time. I hadn't met coworkers in years. I absolutely loved it. And sp- there was only sparkling water. There was no <laughs> there was no still water. And I developed a taste for it. Now I have to have it. If you want to get picky about it, we're not sponsored. But my favorite sparkling water that we drink literally so much is Topo Chico. Topo Chico sparkling water is the best sparkling water. And Disney opinion. started carrying uh, back to Disney. <gasps> Disneyland started carrying Topo Chico. I knew so we now, would get there. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Question number four. Would you like to survive the zombie apocalypse? Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I would be such a great supervillain in that. Um... <laughs> you would. Yeah. You would. It's yeah. true. As long as you still love me, we're cool. Oh, I mean, I, I will protect the people I love. Uh, you notice he didn't say yes, Cammy. I'll still love you. He just said. <laughs> uh, you, you, would be, you would be in my compound, whatever we would call it. I don't but know. I would, wanna, it, I would want yeah. us to be in a compound together. Yeah, and it would I, have to be. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advocate for Rick. He's a great cook. I, I, I'm here for okay. it. Let's do okay. it. Whoa, awesome. Cool. cool. Yeah. I assume uh, in a zombie apocalypse, we're going to have, we're not going to have a lot of options and cuisine, but. Right, you know, I'm here for no, it. No, but I get to. I, I'm. I'm getting better at growing food. Ooh, yeah. I, I wish I had more of a green th- green thumb too. I don't. Uh, we have so much to catch up on. So much to catch up on on the next episode of Mildly Interesting People when we have quiz. <laughs> All right, question number five. For those of you who are familiar, question the last question of the Mildly Interesting Question Round is always one that we roll a twenty sided die for. And then we ask a question off of our list. We pre-rolled the die. This is the sparkly pink die for Chris. I'm so excited. He got number 19. And number 19 is a really, I'm interested in the answer to this one. Chris, what do you collect? Uh, moments. I'm not a stuffed person. I don't. I, I uh, So um, when I was a kid, I collected comic book cards and action figures and CDs and you know, my mom had passed away and I had to start trimming down like what I could care- take with me because I still had to go to school. I still had to figure this stuff out. And so I never really had stuff and I never really liked stuff. Um, so for me, I try to focus on having really awesome moments to have with people because at least for right now, uh, memories are forever. Yeah. And so that's what I collect. That was beautiful. Thank you. I'm going to share a side note with you because you'll appreciate this. We have had one other guest that we've asked that question. So what do you collect? It was Anne McCarthy. Oh. And her answer was, uh, I will, I will not do justice to her answer, but she collects rocks that represent her favorite people. She will do something with a person and ask them to select a rock that represents them. And then she keeps it forever. That is a good answer. Yeah. That's really good. Um, and I've also very Anne answer. Yeah, it is a very Anne answer. So uh, that was some inside baseball for those of you who know both Anne and Chris, because there are some of you. Um, and then Anne and Chris who know each other. Anyway, uh, hey, hey, Rick, you want to yes. do that thing you do where you wrap the show up in a nice, shiny little sure. bow? Sure, I would be happy to. Uh, Chris, just an absolute pleasure to get the chance to spend some some quality time with you. You are a calming presence for the show like this felt like it could have gone on for hours and hours and hours without any hesitation um not 
to reference Cammy in this wrap up, but it's always such a delight to see her light up around the people that she loves <laughs> when we're able to have them on the show. So thank you for making the the time to be with us. Thank you for sharing your expertise and and thank you for as as would be expected, continuing to be open and and transparent about what you're seeing in the world and where you believe things could be better. So that kind of feedback I think is always critical it needs to be heard and we appreciate you taking the time here to share that with us so thank you oh thank you it was so, this was so awesome thanks. hopefully i'll be on again yes no you've already been yeah, invited you're, back. you're a senior correspondent you will have to be back Ooh, I, I already got yeah. a promotion wow yeah. this is a terrific awesome. gig <laughs> <laughs> all right everyone thanks for joining us go See listen later. to chris's podcasts and stuff go, and go things. listen to go i'm actually going to listen to two of these and i don't listen to podcast cool so and, i'm just and the rest of the people can do that too so yeah, i'll link awesome. to so dark side divas and marvelous divas unless you like role playing and then you should go listen to for light and dice and we will be linking all of those up yep. so yep check them for out sure. awesome. thank you all bye everybody mm -hmm. bye